Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. So today we are going to talk all about breastfeeding. I'm going to give you some tips and tricks. I'm going to also share with you the products that I really enjoy using that make my breastfeeding journey super efficient and easy. I hope that you take away a lot of tips and tricks from this video. First and foremost, before we start this video, I just want to say this. Your self-worth your worth as a mother is not calculated by whether you are able to breastfeed or not. It also does not matter how long you breastfed for. You are worthy, you are a wonderful mother. Breastfeeding has nothing to do with that. Now, as somebody who has breastfed both of their babies and will be breastfeeding this baby, I'm going to share with you what I do to make breastfeeding super easy and efficient for myself. Some of these things might not work for you or along the way you might find your own system that works better, but I'm hoping that my system can work for you as well. So let's start right from the beginning. So. For me, my breast milk comes in usually around the second day mark. Now, this might be different for you. Your body might react differently. It might come right away. It might take a few more days. And whether you've had a vaginal birth or a cesarean birth, I do know that when you have a C-section, sometimes it might take a little bit longer for your body to sort of trigger those hormones to get that milk producing. But what you want to do when you have the baby not in your belly anymore, but in your arms, is you want to get that baby on your nipples. Breastfeed, breastfeed, breastfeed. The more that you breastfeed, the more that it will trigger those hormones and it will tell your body to start producing milk. Your baby's belly size is so tiny in the beginning. One of the biggest fears that moms have right off the bat is that they feel their body's not producing enough milk. And realistically, a very, 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 very tiny, small amount of women actually fall into that category. Babies will naturally cluster feed to tell your body, it signals your body to produce more milk. It's natural. It's exactly what your baby's supposed to do and your body 99.9% .9 of the time will react positively to that and will create more milk. So if your baby is feeling, seems fussy and constantly wanting to to breastfeed in any phase. This will happen, you know, in the beginning, two month mark, three month mark, six month mark, 10 month mark, two years into breastfeeding. It's a natural process of your baby telling your body to create milk and your body saying, okay, cool, yeah, I'm gonna create more milk for you. There are those rare instances where people do not naturally produce more milk, but unfortunately a low milk supply is often overdiagnosed. So keep that in mind. If you want your milk to come in, allow that baby to cluster feed. Just continue to feed. Whenever the baby seems to be fussy, if you change the baby's diaper, if the baby has slept, baby might be hungry, put the baby on the breast. Now, once your milk supply has come in, this is what I do. So this goes against a lot of baby textbooks and baby advice, so I need to put that disclaimer. This is something that I personally have experienced myself, and I am going to go against what the professionals say. Now, what I was told in my first child with my son was to not introduce a bottle until about five or six weeks because it would cause nipple confusion. Well, when five weeks rolled around and I tried to introduce a bottle, my baby didn't want to take the bottle and it was very stressful. It was a serious struggle for me. I felt super claustrophobic. I was at that point in my motherhood journey where I really just wanted to have a little bit more of normalcy. I wasn't able to leave the house for more than a half an hour or an hour without panicking that I would have to rush back and, you know, feed my child. It also created sort of a high intensity, high anxiety inducing situation for my husband because every time I'd leave the house, he kind of knew in the back of his head he wasn't able to feed the baby. So if my son wanted to eat, he would basically be, he'd be screwed. <laughs> It caused a lot of additional emotions for both of us in our new journey to parenthood. So I knew the second time around with my daughter that I was going to introduce a bottle much sooner. And I actually introduced the bottle the third day of her life. It was the day, first day that we came home from the hospital and I was able to introduce a bottle then. She took it right away. She had absolutely no nipple confusion whatsoever. Having those two options to her was just always a natural thing, so I think it really worked well. Now, I'm sure there are babies who might still get nipple confusion if you give bottles. 
Keep in mind, we only gave a bottle maximum once a day. Realistically, though, it was every two to three days we would give one bottle, and it was just to sort of give me a little time to catch up on sleep or to take a nice long shower or to step out of the house for a few hours with my toddler because at that point, we had another baby in the mix, and I really wanted to make sure that I got quality time with our first child as well. So here's how I went about collecting milk. On the second day, my milk came in. On the third day, I was home. So by the time that I was home my breasts were engorged I was creating a ton of milk I feel like this might not be the same for everyone but for me at least when my milk comes in it comes in full force and my breasts are engorged and painful and full and then over time a few days I regulate my milk and tell my body exactly how much to give I along with my child so child's breastfeeding I'm also including in some pumping, which we'll talk about in a second. I, along with my baby, is telling my body exactly how much milk. Remember? Supply and demand. So what I do is on that third day, I will use my haka. Now, if you've never seen a haka before, let me pull it out for you. It comes in a box like this, and this is what it looks like. This is a milk catching device that you put onto your breast, but it's not a real genuine pump. You need to use your body's natural function along with this for it to work. So I have my newborn baby and I'm like, okay, baby wants to feed. So I choose a breast to feed my baby on. I will first, before I have my baby latch, I will take my haka, I will pull it back like this, I will squeeze it, so I'll hold it back, I will squeeze it nice and tight, and then I will take my breast that I'm not feeding on, attach it to my nipple, and let go and let that pop over. And it attaches to my boob like this. Now, there's natural suctioning happening. Then, I go and I take my baby and I breastfeed my baby on the opposite side that doesn't have this contraption on it. And what it does is my baby will stimulate letdown. Letdown is when your body is being signaled to let the milk start flowing to and out of your nipple. So your baby will stimulate letdown and have your milk start flowing. And normally, normally, for some people, it will flow out of the other nipple natural, naturally just because, which is when breast pads come into play. <laughs> but when your baby is stimulating letdown on this breast and you have your haka suction to this breast, this suction is telling your body, hey, there's also a baby on this side that's trying to eat as well. And it will, the suction from here will stimulate letdown on this side also. So milk starts flowing not only from this nipple, but also from this nipple. And the milk starts to be collected in here. And this is really great for in the beginning when your body sort of trying to regulate milk and because the baby's stomach in the beginning is so tiny you catch you know anywhere from two to five ounces sometimes so you can catch less than that and even more than that truthfully depending on your body I usually catch about two to three ounces in here that's a whole feed that's an entire feed and you have like a whole bag of milk more or less that you're putting away in the fridge at or fridge or freezer at that point so I never had to pull out my pump at all all I had to do was just have the baby latch and put this on my breast right beforehand and boom I have the baby's first bottle before we move on I just want to say that I really love the haka too because for me in the beginning when baby is small I will feed from only one breast I want to make sure that that baby is getting four milk and hind milk your body produces is fore milk and hind milk. And while it's a very, well, pretty simple concept, it definitely complicates breastfeeding. So I'm not going to talk too much about it. If you want to find out more information on fore milk and hind milk, just do a simple Google search and you'll be able to do so. I do like to feed in the beginning from one breast for my baby per feed to make sure that they're getting that fore milk and hind milk as well. What I really love about using the Hakka is that I'm not taking away a full feeding from my baby because my baby in the beginning will be cluster feeding often. I don't know if my baby's gonna wanna eat in a half an hour or three hours. So I feed personally on demand. I don't do that every two hours. When my baby wants to eat, I put my baby on my breast. I also don't wake a sleeping baby. I've never have, um, my babies have always gained weight very efficiently. They've always had wet diapers and I have always had good sleeping babies. So um, that's another one of those things that really, 
you can choose who you want to listen to, but you make your own decision as a parent. Your pediatrician might say one thing, your midwife or your lactation consultant might say another thing, but you just take all the information in and you make the best educated decision that you can for you and your baby. For me personally, I've never, like I said, I've never woken a sleeping baby and I feed on demand and it's always worked for us. But I don't know if my newborn baby is going to want to eat in 15 minutes or if they're going to want to eat in three hours. So I don't like the idea of pumping fully this breast while the baby's eating this breast because I don't really want to take a lot of milk away from this breast. So I like this because it's just basically a natural flow of milk, whereas my pump, which we'll talk about in a second, would really truly be pulling a lot of milk out of my breast. Now let's talk about where pumping comes into play and how I really get a lot of milk into the freezer. For the first few days of my baby's life, maybe up to a week, I will only really use the haka. I don't, I personally don't see any other use. The baby's stomach is so small, they don't need a lot of milk per feeding, and I'm able to use this more or less every single time I feed and get a few bags into the fridge slash freezer. But before my milk really does regulate and it will continue to regulate up until like six months actually it forever regulates with supply and demand when my breasts are no longer engorged um, and it my body is naturally decreasing the amount of milk that it's supplying I try to incorporate the pump and that's because I want my body to think that it has to produce one more feed than it actually does. Now, I could do two feeds, I could do three feeds, but realistically, I don't want to complicate my breastfeeding too much to where I start to hate pumping. Um, and then I have a, an oversupply that I'm having trouble getting rid of. I like to just incorporate one little pumping session, and this is how I do it. Really two, it's, it's one per breast. Go back to the scenario that I was explaining before. I had the haka on this breast. I had the baby feeding on this breast. When I am finished with both of those and I have my haka milk sitting there, I will then take my pump and the breast that my child has already drank from, I will then take this and remove any other milk that is in that breast as well and try to get as much milk as I can. Now I'm getting hind milk here and I got my four milk here. I can put these both together in a bag and now I have a really nice bag of milk that has four milk and hind milk in it. We can put it in the fridge, we can have it prepped to go in the freezer and I'm really truly getting a lot of milk. So pretty much every feed I'm getting some milk in here. Two times a day, one on each breast. I'm getting some extra milk here. Now every single day I'm using those and I'm really getting my supply going and it sounds like a lot of extra work, but truthfully it isn't. If there ever comes a point in time where I don't feel like using those, especially at nighttime, to tell you the truth, I can always just skip it. I don't have to attach my haka. I don't have to pump afterwards. I'm not interfering with my baby's supply of milk. I'm never taking milk away from my baby that my baby might actually end up needing. I'm only taking the little bit that my baby has left over and I'm only taking a little bit in the beginning of my next feed. Chances are it's gonna be another hour, or hour and a half or two hours until my baby wants to eat again and my, my supply will refill. So from there I have this filled with milk and this filled with milk. I like using two different types of bags. I have these bags right here. They are by Juno Bee. It's a silicone reusable bag. I like to use these as my fridge bags only and I think you can freeze these but I don't see any point in doing so. But I like to use these because um, that's when I really like go through bags the most. I have two of these and what I do is I will then take my milk out of the haka and I will pour it into here and I will put it into the fridge. The next feed, I will then do the same thing. I will take the milk out of there, put it into my second bag, put them into the fridge. You can take milk from multiple feeds and put it all together. You just have to do it at the same temperature. And I like to stick with the same day. Then by the third feed, enough time has gone by for these two bags of milk in the fridge to be at the same temperature. I can then either A, pour one into the other if I still need to, to collect more milk, or I can then pour both of these bags into one of these bags, which I've used all the bags. These end up being my favorite. They're not the best bags. They just don't leak and they do a really good job in the freezer. 
Um, but something just to point out, which like all breastfeeding bags are pretty notorious for, is that <laughs> it's really frustrating. Um, once you pour the milk into here, you can pour the same amount of milk into multiple different bags and they'll all give you a different measurement. They all just kind of stink at measuring accurately. I usually use a little scale, to tell you the truth, that ends up working out the best for me. I just find these to be like the easiest bags. They're the cheapest, they're the most readily available, and I like to just use one type of bag. So then I will take this milk and I will pour it into one of these bags. I will open this for you just so that you guys, if you've never seen a breastfeeding bag before, I'm sure I have a lot of new soon-to-be mamas who are watching this video right now. So they come in bags like this, and then you open it up. Here's what the breastfeeding bags look like. They are completely sealed, so you take this off, and then you know that the bag has been opened. Um, and then I go like this, pour the milk in. You can do like all different types of like things, like flip the bag inside out. I don't even bother. You pretty much just want to do it slowly. And you pour the milk into the bag. Um, I find it easier to actually write on the bag before you have the milk in it. Here would be your bag of milk. You would then close it, write on it. You can write yourself like a little note, like you are amazing, you're a credible mama, whatever. It's really nice to just like get a couple months later when you're pulling frozen milk out of the bag, just a little reminder to yourself. You definitely wanna put the date and more or less the ounces. You can put the time if you want to. I personally have never been the type of person to take like nighttime milk and daytime milk. They say that your body creates two different types of milk and that you should use nighttime milk at nighttime milk and daytime milk at daytime milk. Both my children are gorgeous and healthy and just wonderful, <laughs> not to be biased, but um, I never did that. I think it complicated it a little bit too much for me, and you basically just want to try to do your best. Just do your best. You don't, don't overcomplicate things for yourself. You just go into it trying to do the best that you can do, and if it starts to just be way too much, way too overwhelming or whatnot, then you scale it back however you need to. You have your bag of milk, right? Make sure it's nice and sealed. Now this is another gadget that I absolutely swear by, and if you followed my channel at all, you'll know that I swear by it. Here is called a Milky Freeze, and it is fantastic. It is such a smart little contraption. So you put this into your freezer, right? And it has this metal tin base here. And it allows you to lay your bag of breast milk nice and perfectly flat. It's so great, see? So great. And you have that just sitting in the freezer, just like that. And then by the time that you have your next bag of milk that you're ready to put into the freezer, this is frozen. Nice and frozen and flat. You then take your bag of milk and you just plop it in there. Now you have your milk slowly stacking up here. When you go to pull frozen milk out of here, you're pulling the oldest bag. So you're guaranteeing that you will always pull the oldest bag of milk from your freezer, which is what you wanna do. You always wanna use your oldest milk first, that way nothing goes to waste. I personally like to go by the, I wish it wasn't six, because obviously this has a demonic meaning, but 666 rule. And it's also plus or minus two depending on certain variables and like temperature, really. But six hours on the countertop, six days in the fridge, and six months in the freezer. So that's what I go by. But at the end of the day, always sniff your milk, always smell it. You will notice going into breastfeeding that your milk will change colors and will also change smells. It shouldn't ever smell bad. Like it shouldn't ever be like a sour, putrid smell. You are okay if it has sort of like a soapy smell that actually means something. I think it's like high lip base, lip base. It will have some sort of a scent to it. Like you know how even unscented things have sort of like a fragrance to them a little bit? Think about it along those lines. But if something smells sour or, or like you smell it and your first reaction is like, ooh, do not give it to your baby. If the milk is sour, I just don't use it at all. I will literally throw it away. I, I know that some people will use it in like baths and whatnot, but I don't really wanna put like soured milk in anything. So I personally choose to throw it away. 
if I have milk that's left out on the counter for a little too long and I smell it and it still smells fine, I'll actually just close the bag and put it back into the fridge or the freezer. And I will then relabel that milk as bath milk or I will use it um, on my lips if I have chapped lips or if my baby has eczema, I will use it on eczema. I will use it on non-consumption things. And because breast, because breast milk is incredible, conjunctivitis, a little bit of breast milk, goes a long way. More often than not, you don't have to throw away your milk, even if you're past that 666 rule, but you always wanna smell your milk and just make sure that it doesn't smell like sour or gross or anything like that. Now, because we're trying to get a massive stash going here, this will fill up eventually. You'll be surprised how many bags of milk actually fit into this. It's a lot, but our goal is to create like a huge stash. So we're going to say once this reaches maximum, I then like to switch over to these bad boys. And I get these from Home Goods, Marshalls, TJ Maxx, $3.99. You can buy them off of Amazon, um, but they're super expensive off of Amazon. They're like $20 for two of them, like 10 bucks each. These are way cheaper, and this will hold breast milk bags. So, I will show you. They will hold the bags like this, and you are good to go. You now have a little container that will hold all of the breast milk bags. And you wanna make sure that you start in the front as well. You wanna pull the oldest milk once again. So you'll know that you'll be pulling from the front and your milk will be moving this way and you can just keep replenishing in the back here. So I really like to use these as well. I will basically just have my little side of the freezer. I will have this sitting somewhere and then I will have these directly next to it. And I'm just able to keep my, my milk nice and neat and stored. A lot of people will get like a deep chest freezer, but I don't have the space for it and I've honestly just never needed to. I'm able to efficiently store my milk um, and I do try to use the milk um, as I go through because there's no point in just having all of this unused breast milk that eventually goes bad after six months. I know that you can prolong the lifespan of your milk if you do have a deep freezer, I think until like a year they said. I personally just, I never needed to do that. Um, but that's something to keep in mind. Now, really quickly with your pump, when you give a bottle, still continue to pump. Let's say hypothetically, I need to go to like a two hour long appointment. Let's say I'm gonna go get my hair done or something like that. Dan will be home with the baby and he will pull milk from the fridge slash freezer. I will be at my appointment getting my hair done. My breasts are still creating that milk because they think that a baby's going to be feeding during that time. I won't sit there and pump at the exact same time that the baby would normally be feeding. I will allow myself just to be out and enjoy whatever I'm doing. But when I get home and my breasts are full, I will then pull out my pump and I will pump. So I will pump at least one full breast. If my baby's hungry, I'll put them on the other breast. But I will pump depending on the scenario. I always make sure to pump though because you still want to tell your body to create that feed. A lot of women will actually at nighttime if their baby starts to sleep more throughout the night sometimes they will wake up and still pump at that time just to keep their supply up. You can then take all of that nighttime milk that the baby really truly doesn't want anymore and you can start putting that into the freezer as well. It really just depends on how much effort you want to put into your stash, how much milk you might actually need. A lot of women who go back to work who need to have that milk for like a daycare or for their caregiver at home or their husband if their husband is the one who's home with the baby a lot of the times they will just wake up still that night feed and they'll get a lot of milk they'll get two five ounce bags um, which is basically like two feeds and they have that for the next day and they will just keep that fresh milk in the fridge and just hand them fresh milk or they will put it into the freezer and then they will take the oldest milk so that they're not just using super fresh milk all the time and their stash is getting older and older and older. Does that make sense? So um, it really depends on your situation too. So I get to be home with my babies, which I am so incredibly grateful for. So I don't really need to have like a substantial amount of milk to hand somebody over. I really just need to have some for like random situations where, you know, I need to be out and about doing something or I need to film a video or whatnot and Dan's going to have to give a bottle. But rule of thumb, if you want to keep that feed, you have to pump it out. So if the baby's having a bottle during the time that you would normally have a feeding session and you want to keep that feeding session, you need to pump. You need to tell your body once again, 
this milk is still being demanded and you need to supply it. If at nighttime you're like, yay, my baby's finally not waking up three times a night, it's wake waking up two times a night, and you don't want to have to feed that third time or pump that third time, then you don't want to pump. You don't want to signal to your body to create that milk, and that's when your body will begin to regulate after a few days and it will no longer you'll no longer be engorged or full during that time and your body will reduce the amount of milk that it makes at nighttime. I have never ever had an issue with my baby sleeping through the night and having no nighttime feeds and then my body all of a sudden not producing a lot during the day. It doesn't work that way. Your body is magical. So magical. You'll notice that when your milk changes depending on whether your baby's sick or not. It, it will like literally change colors to help your baby during certain situations in its life. It's mind-blowing. But I've never had an issue where I've stopped producing milk during the day because at nighttime I wasn't creating milk for like overnight feeds. A lot of breastfeeding is just trusting your body, having faith in your body that it's doing what it's supposed to do. Going back to cluster feeding, that truly is one of the biggest hurdles for a mother's mind to get over because naturally you just want to assume that your baby is unhappy and fussy and constantly wanting to feed because your body's not doing what it's supposed to when really your body is just getting those signals from the baby. The baby is doing exactly what they're supposed to do and tell your body, hey, you need to create more milk because I'm getting bigger, I'm getting healthier, I'm getting stronger, and I'm going to start to need more milk to eat. If you think about it from a formula perspective, if you give your baby a bottle of formula and they're happy and content afterwards and then all of a sudden you give your baby a bottle of formula multiple times and they're still fussy afterwards and they still want more milk, you're just going to give them more milk next time. <laughs> your body needs a little while to be able to make that switch to creating more milk. So yes, there will be a little bit of a fussy period for your child, but they will do their job. You keep putting them on your breast, your body will continue to cr create more milk and then your body will have more milk to give your baby. As your baby becomes more efficient in breastfeeding and as you become more efficient in breastfeeding, everyone becomes more efficient and your body does exactly what it's supposed to. So you just have to be a little patient and just have to be a little trustworthy to your body, especially during a time where you have no idea what you're doing basically, <laughs> um, motherhood and breastfeeding. You kind of just have to like be there and let it happen. Now for those of you who are like, yeah, but how do I know if my baby isn't getting enough? Well, you'll know by diapers. You'll know, is my baby peeing? You want to make sure that your baby's having some nice, great, wet diapers. You want to make sure that your baby's pooping. I know some babies don't poop every day. Some babies go like a week and a half without pooping. More so the peeing diapers. You want to make sure that your baby has good pee diapers. And then you'll go to your pediatrician and they weigh the baby and you'll see whether the baby is gaining weight or not, and your pediatrician will talk to you about that. Another thing that I really quickly want to bring up is a lip tie and a tongue tie. If you are having excruciating pain while breastfeeding, if your baby does not seem to be latching, if they are making really weird clicking noises or <sniffs> noises like this, or they just don't seem to really have a good grasp, or they get super tired and they'll let go of their latch constantly all the time while they're feeding, your baby might have a lip tie or a tongue tie. Now, since I've made my last video, it's been talked about a lot more commonly. Thank you. Medical providers are actually bringing this up, but a lot of babies have lip ties or tongue ties. And what that is, is if you lift up your lip or you lift your tongue up and look in a mirror, that little flap of skin that's holding them down Sometimes that's a lot more forward and sometimes it restricts the opening of your baby's mouth and prevents them from really getting a good latch. That will cause them to sit funky on your nipple. It will cause you nipple pain, nipple bleeding. I just want to point out that I've always had nipple pain and nipple bleeding in the beginning of my breastfeeding journey. Even though I was still breastfeeding my son when I got pregnant with my daughter, that's how small of amount of time I took as a break from breastfeeding. I still, once again, had nipple pain and nipple bleeding. Again, however, my son had a lip tie and my daughter had a lip tie, a tongue tie, and, and buckle ties, which are the cheek ties as well. So you can have cheek ties as well. My poor daughter's mouth was just so constricted. She wasn't able to really get a good latch. So if you are having issues 
your pediatrician is not the person to talk to. This is like a subjective topic with pediatricians for some reason. I don't know why they're just not more informed. They always say that it's like overdiagnosed, but it's not. It's super underdiagnosed and they're really just not helping the situation because poor mothers go through such trauma with breastfeeding because they think it's their body when really it's something as simple as getting a revision for your baby's mouth and everything is just completely changed like that. I'm not going to go into too much detail as to how you go about fixing that, but it's a very, very simple procedure. You want to make sure that you're going to a preferred provider who is an ENT or a pediatric dental surgeon. If you go onto Facebook, there is a lip tie and tongue tie group. It's the biggest one. You'll see it right away. You want to become a member of that group. You can ask any questions you have there. You can go search through people's experiences and you can also see in the files they have a list of of preferred providers, aka people who you can really trust their opinion, and you can then see for your state, even your country, where you are within your country, those specialty people that you can go to who really are experienced and well-versed when it comes to lip ties and tongue ties, and you can go and you can speak to them. My insurance has forever covered the procedure. If you don't have any insurance, it's about 600 ish dollars, about 400 to 600 dollars for you to get the revisions done. So just keep that in mind. But m most insurances cover it. It's something that can completely change your breastfeeding journey. So just keep that in mind if you are struggling a lot in the beginning and your baby just doesn't seem to be latching properly. Also keep in mind though that babies are new to breastfeeding just as you are. You both are going to really stink at it in the beginning and you're both are going to get more efficient over time. I noticed both my babies got super efficient around the six week mark. Uh, they were able to really reduce their feedings from like a half an hour to like 10 minutes. There were at times where when my babies were like six months into it where they were just like having five minute feeds and it was just like boom, boom, boom. It gets really, really easy after a while. It's just those beginning few months that are really, really hairy there for a little while. Before we end this video, I want to talk to you about a few other little random tidbits that I want to tell you about breastfeeding just to mention. One, when you have any type of products that you are using, and things that attach to your nipple like this. Normal size ones are 24 millimeter. More often than not, you are not this size. I'm not this size. I don't have like M&M nipples, but I have a much smaller nipple size than what this is meant for. You can also do a Google search and just look into um, how to measure your nipple size. A lot of them will do it by the size of coins. So. A, um, a dime, a nickel, a quarter. I have dime-sized nipples, for those of you who want to know. I find that a 21 millimeter one of these fits my breasts way better. This can really cause pain and it can also affect the amount of milk that you're getting from your pump. So you want to make sure that you have the correct size one of these. Also when your baby goes to latch, there's a lot of misunderstanding when your baby goes to latch, especially when you're a first time breastfeeding mom. And your baby is not just like attaching, like let's say like this is the nipple. Your baby is not attaching here, right, to the nipple. Your baby, when you have like a boob, right, your boob and you have your areola, you're really, you really want to pancake your boob and the baby's going to attach to your areola. They're going to go over your nipple. They don't have a little bit of bite on the nipple they're really getting their latch on that areola, on that fatty part of your breast. Um, and if you have them only latching to your nipple, your nipples will hurt a lot, a lot. So don't do that. <laughs> Try not to do that. You also want to bring the baby to you, not you to the baby. You don't want to be hunched over when you're breastfeeding. I promise you, you can do like permanent damage. With my son, I had like a hunchback after a year of breastfeeding and not bringing the baby to me. Um, I got one of those like buffalo humps at the back of my neck from my neck being forward so much. You really want to get comfortable. You want to sit back, have your pillows. I like using the boppy pillow. Have those pillows ready to go. Have a little breastfeeding station uh, with all your little breastfeeding gadgets and bring the baby up to your boob, sit comfortably and allow them to breastfeed. Also, if you start to have breast pain or you have a lump, 
you could have a clogged duct or you can have mastitis. Mastitis is usually accompanied with a fever, red skin, seems very angry and irritated, and you feel like crud, like you feel sick. That is mastitis. Mastitis can go into your bloodstream and get very dangerous, hospital dangerous. So you want to make sure if you're feeling crummy and you have a fever and your boob is hurting, you want to get into the doctor and get some antibiotics. If you have a clogged duct, however, which I get all the time, I like to have gravity help me. So sometimes I'll get on all fours and I will really just do this. I will massage that lump, that clogged duct. I will use my pump while I'm doing that. Have my pump going, trying to pull out that, that clog. You can even take your hotka and you can take some Epsom salt, some warm water, and you can attach it to your boob and just do this, and the Epsom salt will go into your nipple, and it will just be like a suctioning, Epsom-y, salty type of thing, and it will actually help you unclog that duct. Uh, a lot, there's been a lot of things that have worked. I just find like putting my baby on my breast and really just pushing, 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 and really needing my breast actually gets the duct to be unclogged, and I can feel it when it unclogs. It's like a very strange feeling. So that's another thing that you want to pay attention to is that you can actually have like ailments when you're breastfeeding. And then also troubleshooting breastfeeding. They have multiple different types of things. They have something called a nipple shield. This is a little flappy contraption that goes over your breast. Um, have the baby attach onto that. It also helps when you have flat nipples or inverted nipples. That's a very common thing. A lot of people will have flat nipples where they don't really get super hard and like protrude. If you have that, just know that I went into breastfeeding with pretty flat nipples and now my nipples are like forever pronounced and I think that's just from breastfeeding. I did use a nipple shield in the beginning of Cooper's, uh, my first breastfeeding experience with my son Cooper and we used it for six weeks and just like everyone said around the six week mark, one day you'll just like forget it or it won't be clean and you'll just try to put the baby on and the baby will just start eating and you'll never look back and that's exactly what happened. So nipple shields tend to be a very temporary thing but it will help you if you have cracked or bleeding nipples and you just cannot handle the fact <laughs> that you're in so much pain but you need to feed your baby. Using those can really help you and I think it's like $7.99 for a two pack on Amazon. So you can get those. They also make those little metal thingies they're like little metal cups that go over your boobs those are expensive but people swear by them and i think that the silver like it helps heal your nipples it also is cold and it feels nice on your nipples when they're sore and it also prevents your nipples from having any type of fabric just kind of like uh, rubbing up against them and causing them to be even more sensitive. There are disposable nipple pads and there are reusable nipple pads. I like the reusable ones. I just think they're so much easier. I usually use the bambooby ones. They're over there. I'm not going to get up and show you, but I'll link everything that you're seeing right now below. And they also make these little gel packs. So I have the booby tubes from Earth Mama. I like those the best. They seem to just be like the most natural one. They're not made with gel, but you can get gel ones where you can either put them into the microwave and warm them up or you can put them into the freezer and have them be ice cool packs. The ice pack is really good for when your breasts are engorged and you need some like relief and then when you have them warm it's really good for you to try to get rid of um, a clogged duct. So having that pad that you can just like put into your bra uh, or you can like lay it onto your breast while your baby feeds it's really good for helping you with that clogged duct. That's another like breastfeeding accessory that you can have and you can use and it will hopefully help make your breastfeeding journey a little bit easier. But this video is already extremely long. I knew it would be, but I wanted to just try to give you as much information as I possibly could jam pack into a video. I hope that you guys find this to be so informative. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate. I will answer them all down below. So you go ahead and you comment. Please subscribe to our channel because we're going to be having a baby so soon and I cannot wait. And you can follow along my breastfeeding journey as it actually happens. Once again, your worth is not measured by whether you breastfeed or not or for however long you breastfeed. Do not let it take over your life or consume your life. We have 
incredible formulas that do an incredible job for our babies. It is just not worth your sanity. It is not worth ruining your motherhood. Give it all that you got. It's going to be really difficult and really time consuming in the beginning, but I do promise you that it gets so easy and it becomes easier than formula a few months in. So do try to stick with it, but at the end of the day, you are not a bad mom because you choose not to breastfeed you are exactly the mama that you are supposed to be for your baby. You are perfect for them. Just always remember that. But that is it, guys. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you in the next one. Bye. The world could fall down. It's gonna be okay.